We are in the book of Acts chapter 23 and 24 today. Last week we saw Apostle Paul shared his testimony in uh, chapter 22 because uh, he was caught in the temple. Uh, they falsely accused him that he was desecrating the temple by bringing Gentiles into the holy place, uh, which, uh, which was not true, but they caught hold of him anyway and then uh, when uh, they were beating him, he was rescued by uh, the commander. And uh, he uh, shared his, uh, his testimony before all people. And starting from chapter 23, 23 to 26, we see four different times Paul, um, Paul stands up before four different kinds of people. Uh, in chapter 23, we see Sanhedrin. Um, and then later we see Felix, Festus, and uh, Agrippa, four different people. And he uh, basically shares his faith and defends his faith before these people. Sanhedrin, as we know, it's a Jewish ruling council. Even though they were under Roman, uh, Roman rule, uh, for uh, Jews uh, you know, to judge their uh, religious uh, disputes, they have uh, set up this Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is uh, formed with 70 elders and they have a high priest that presides the Sanhedrin. And Paul was before them and uh, he started off his defense uh, starting from verse 1 in chapter 23. Paul looked, at, uh, looked straight at uh, Sanhedrin and he said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty in all good conscience this day. Paul was very clear in his conscience what he was doing. You know, it was, not, it, it was uh, like a blasphemy, it was like, a, um, like against their religion for Jews, but when uh, Paul examined himself, he was uh, having good conscience of what he was preaching, what he was practicing. You know, we should have that conscience like, you know, if somebody comes and asks us, you know, we should have that with a clear conscience. I am believing this because I am convicted of this truth. And uh, I am 100% sure that uh, this is the right way. And Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And He is life. And uh, I am, with all my clear conscience, I am following this. In um, chapter, chapter 23, verse uh, 8, we see... Uh, that there were two sects of people, Sadducees and uh, Pharisees, right? There are two kinds of people we see here. There were many other sects of people in Jews like SNS and, and Jealous. There are different kinds of people. But here, there are two kinds were represented. There were Pharisees and Sadducees. Who are these people? Pharisees are basically the teachers of the law. Uh, they meticulously follow the law. They made a lot of rules thinking that they will help in their practical life. They have made rules like how far you can walk uh, during the Sabbath day. How much weight can you lift? All, all kinds of rules. Uh, Sadducees, uh, they are aristocrats and they, they are like a ruling uh, uh, people. And they don't believe in resurrection. They don't believe there are angels or spirits. But Pharisees believe all those. In other words, uh, Sadducees are, um, are in error. Basically, if, if this is the world that saw, actually, in today's world, some of the people, they believe this. You know, they, they, need not be, they are not Christians or they are not Jews. Some people, they believe that this world is all there is. There is nothing after death. There is nothing beyond this world. Sadducees have that kind of belief. You know, when you have only this world, there is nothing beyond that. There is no rationale for living a righteous life. There is no reason for living a moral life. Because, you know, there is no judgment, there is nothing. So why do you want to even try to live a good life? You know, there is, that's one of the reasons we say 
uh, uh, one of the arguments for um, for the existence of God, because for an atheist, there is no motivation to live a moral life. There is no reason to actually there is no he cannot even say this is good, this is bad, because when you the moment you say this is good and this is bad, you are comparing uh, that good and bad with a standard. Because how do you know this is good? You know, if there is no God, if there is no standard outside of man, you know, if, if a man makes up rules, for me something looks good, for somebody else something, looks, something might not look good. The same thing might not look good. You know, we always go outside of humankind to find that, that a standard to see, uh, you know, to, to compare this good or bad. A lot of people uh, bring up this question, if God is a good God, why there is so much suffering in this world? If God is a good God, why He allows people to suffer? Why there are poor people? Why there are people who are starving in Africa? You know, if God is good, you know, He should take care of all of them. The, the very people, they, they don't believe there is a God exists, and they try to uh, bring up this argument saying there is a morality, there is good and bad, there is a there is a evil and there is good. You know, if you don't even believe in God, there is no point in saying this is evil, this is good. Uh, these people, Sadducees, were like that. And they came to accuse Paul. And here, Paul knows that, you know, they believe uh, they don't believe in resurrection, but whereas um, Pharisees, they believe in resurrection. And uh, when Paul talked about resurrection, there was a great uproar. And uh, people actually fought about him. You know, Pharisees and Sadducees, they, were, they both fought. Uh, and finally, you know, Pharisees were arguing that, what if some angel appeared to Paul? And uh, there is a resurrection. So angels are there. Some angel might, might have appeared to Paul. You know, uh, what he is preaching is not bad at all. Whereas Sadducees, because they don't even believe in afterlife or um, the, the angels, so they were arguing that what he was, uh, he was sharing is nonsense. At this point, you know, they became so violent and then they were going to attack Paul and turn him into pieces. At that point, the commander came and uh, he sent troops to bring him out. And then he was sent to barracks. Actually, Paul was rescued from their clutches. We don't know why at that point, but later we see that Paul had to stand up before these governors, kings, and uh, finally before Caesar and God has a plan that's why in verse 11 we see uh, 23 verse 11 in the night time the Lord came and says the Lord stood near Paul verse 11 see God's comfort God came and stood near Paul what a comforting thought it is you know if you are down and depressed and you don't know what to do if God comes and just, if he stands next to you, how much uh, comforting it is. And here, Paul was being attacked and they were not even listening to what he was saying. And uh, all kinds of uh, things are happening. There was great uproar. God came. He uh, comforted Paul. And he said, God not only came and stood next, next to him, he also spoke to him. Our God is a God who speaks. And, uh, you know, it only, it only differs whether we are listening or not. So God always speaks. And here, God came and God spoke to him saying, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Just like how you testified in Jerusalem, you know, God is taking notice of Paul testifying in Jerusalem. You know, nothing escapes 
God's God's view or uh, God's notice. You know, sometimes we might do some uh, charitable things, and and uh, you know we want to see we want to let others know that we are doing something good, but even before others notice, God notices. That's why in Matthew's gospel we read, you know, uh, you what you are giving with your right hand should not should not be known to your left left hand, and uh, he also says the Pharisees. Uh, and scribes they want to look for a better position or they want to be um, they want to be known to everyone that they are doing good works but you should not be like that and he says what you do should not be known to others because uh, the father in heaven who sees you in secret will give you the reward you know i i told you some time ago um, uh, maybe a long time ago, this um, when I was a student, uh, we had these camps. Um, every every time there was a Dasara or a Sankranti, we had a camp. And uh, one in one of those camps, all the students were um, there, and the, there were speakers, and the camp was going well. And one night, um, and, and then in the night time. There was a speaker who goes and uh, cleans the toilets, and nobody knows. And morning when we get up, everything was very clean. And uh, you know, nobody knew who it was do- who was doing that. But uh, you know, that was the spirit. You know, God wants us to do certain things, but it doesn't matter who notices it. It doesn't matter if somebody is noticing or or not. It is God who rewards us. Actually, it says, uh, in if you read in Matthew's Gospel, you know, if somebody notices, you already got your reward. But if nobody notices, it is God who gives you the reward in heaven. Here, God comes to Paul and he says, what you did in Jerusalem, you know, people might not have noticed, but God is going to reward you. And uh, also, he says, so you must also testify in Rome. God has told Paul that you will be going to Rome and you are going to testify there, just like how you testified in Jerusalem. If you read the next portion, starting from 12 to uh, 22, in that whole section, we read that uh, there was a plot against Paul. There were 40 people who took a vow saying that we will not eat or drink until we kill Paul. You know, here God gave a promise to Paul saying you will be, you will go to Rome and you will testify there. And and on, on the other side, these 40 people, they took a vow saying we will kill Paul, whatever it is, and we will not eat or drink until we kill him. You know, it's like 40 people against God's will. But we know, you know, God will always prevail. And uh, God assures of our future. When God gives a word, it will happen. When um, God gave this word to Abraham, that in you, in you, all the nations of the world will be blessed, he fulfilled it in Jesus Christ. And when God gave that promise to Abraham that I will give your descendants all this land, and God fulfilled it. So, God is a God who fulfills his promises. And here we see 40 people were against Paul. They were trying to kill him. But God rescued Paul. And, uh, you know, Paul's nephew, his sister's son, heard that, that heard them that they were planning for this plot. And he went and told Paul. And Paul told uh, him um, uh, to tell the commander. And then the commander heard this. And immediately that night, with 200 people, he sent Paul to uh, Governor Felix. You know, God's will will happen. Whatever may be man's plans are, you know, we see that in many times, like, you know, even in ministry areas also, when people try to attack some ministries and try to destroy, 
God's will will always happen. And uh, these 40 people, they could not do anything because, you know, God was there motivating this, uh, this commander to send him away to Caesarea. Uh, just after World War II, an American soldier, we know uh, during the World War II, Hitler, he exploited the Jews, he killed 6 million Jews. The World War II happened and then Germany was defeated. One of the American soldiers, he found a little cellar where the Jews were uh, hidden. On, on one of the walls there, it was written, I believe in the sun, even when it does not shine. I believe in love, even when it is not shown. I believe in God, even when I cannot see him work. Sometimes we might not see God coming to us, speaking to us, comforting us, or rescuing us. But we know God is at work and his plans will always fulfill. God says to us, don't stop, don't quit, don't give up. That's what he told uh, Paul. You know, he said, take courage. You know, do what you have been doing. Don't stop. You will testify for me in uh, Rome. You know, even the most faithful servants of God, they will suffer from discouragement and despair. We see how Moses suffered from discouragement. When these people were against him, uh, they were murmuring and they were quarreling against him. You know, he said, Lord, why did you bring all these people here? You know, he was so much discouraged and depressed. A lot of times we see that in uh, many of the godly people, even in Elijah's case, he won the victory against all those Baal prophets and, and he, uh, he was tired and he says, God, take me, take my life. You know, Jonah, he said the same thing. There is a discouragement and, uh, and uh, depression that comes to everybody. But we have to remember, God is always there. God always encourages us. And uh, God says, don't stop, don't quit, don't give up. Sometimes even in the ministry, when, when things don't happen the way we want or the way we expected, we might get discouraged. But God says, don't quit, don't give up. You know, God encourages not because of our success, but because of our faithfulness. You know, uh, here he's talking about Jerusalem. Uh, he says, just like you have been my witness in Jerusalem, you will be my witness in Rome. But actually, we don't know much about Paul's witness in Jerusalem. We read about Peter. We read about John. They did miracles uh, in Jerusalem temple and they preached, Peter preached all his sermons in Jerusalem. We don't see actually Paul preaching. But here, God noticed even that. We don't even know if there was any success out of that. But God noticed because he was faithful in preaching the good news. God notices us when we are faithfully serving the Lord, not when we are successful. So we have to remember that God will never leave us, never forsake us. That's why in Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6, it says that, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let me read Hebrews 12, uh, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. The later portion of uh, chapter, uh, verse 5, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So let's uh, overcome the dis discouragement, depression, whatever maybe your situation is. God is with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Now this commander, his name is Lysias, Claudius Lysias. He wrote a letter 
he sent Paul to Felix. And uh, this governor Felix, he lived in Caesarea, that was like a headquarters. Who was this uh, man, Felix? Felix uh, was born as a slave. He was not actually uh, a Roman, um, Roman royal, uh, he was not born to a royal family, but he was born as a slave, but he was freed. So he was called freedman. And then he was promoted. He was the first slave in the history to become a governor. And he was a governor of Judea from uh, AD 52 to 59. He was a historic person. And uh, this, these things happened in between that time frame, AD 52 to 59, when he was governor of Judea. But later he was recalled by uh, Nero because uh, he mishandled the rights over using violence and uh, he was incompetent and there was so much corruption. Actually, uh, a historian called Tacitus, he writes, Felix exercised the prerogatives of a king with the spirit of a slave. He was so cruel. He was uh, having that, uh, uh, that anger and uh, vengeance and he was oppressing people like anything. And that was the person uh, Felix was. Paul had to stand before him and he had to give a defense of him. You see, even such cruel, unjust, immoral person, even to him, God wanted to give gospel. That was the reason Paul was rescued and he was sent here. You know, God is not a respecter of persons. God is, does not show partiality. A lot of times we hear people from, uh, you know, lower caste or poor people, they are coming and knowing Christ. You know, where is God? God doesn't care about, you know, other caste and uh, other people, rich people. It's not like that. God always gives fair chance to everybody. Here we see Paul was standing before Governor Felix. After that, we see he was standing before Festus, another governor, and he was standing before King Agrippa. Finally, he was standing before Caesar. All these people were, uh, you know, royal family people. And even in the, in the prison, Paul was, uh, Paul was in the Herod's court. And he actually preached there. And later we see some of the people from Herod's uh, family, they came to Christ. So God always gives opportunities to people. And here Paul started off doing his defense and he told the truth and he explained his belief and he says, I worship the same God as these people, these Jews. And I am standing here because of this one issue that is the resurrection. Some people differ in the case of resurrection, I believe there is, uh, there is a resurrection and I am standing up for this man who resurrected, that was Jesus. So that was his, argu that, that was his argument. And, uh, you know, Felix, he postponed and he said he will talk to him later. And later, after some time, he came with his wife Drusilla. You know, we saw who Felix was. He was born slave, but he was freed. But Drusilla was a Jewess. She is from a Jewish family. Actually, she is from a royal line. She was a third wife of Felix. And she became his wife uh, at the age of 19 years. And she left her husband. And her father was uh, King Agrippa. Agrippa I who killed James. We saw that in uh, Acts chapter 12. He killed James and her, her great uncle was uh, Herod Antipas who killed John the Baptist and her great grandfather was Herod the Great who killed many innocent children in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. So actually it is fascinating when I think about these people. These are historic people. They were living at that time. This is not a um, 
not a tale that uh, you know we, somebody wrote in this Bible. These are historic people, and Paul was standing before these royal family people. Even though they are from royal families, they were unjust, immoral, irreligious. They were not afraid of God or man. Look at their lifestyle. Killing whomever comes and uh, you know, talks bad about them or whoever confronts them. John the Baptist confronted this, this king and uh, he was killed. They don't, um, they, they, they don't afraid of, they don't have any fear of God or man. Such people, Paul was here to give gospel to such people. You know, a lot of times, you know, God might uh, take us to, to confront such people. God might take us to talk to people who have been uh, doing the idolatry in their lives, who are so religious in this and following these worldly customs. Maybe God wants you to go to them and uh, share this good news with them. Paul was not afraid. He was not frustrated. And he was never afraid of sharing his own testimony. We see four times he shares his testimony. And uh, Paul taught about righteousness, self-control and judgment. When Felix came with his wife Drusilla, they both sat and Paul explained them. The righteousness. This is an immoral king, governor, and his wife. You know, he was talking to them about righteousness, judgment, self control. And there is a God who judges you. There is a God who resurrects everybody, and there will be judgment. So he was very straightforward in sharing this good news. And uh, finally, Felix said, You know, when I find convenient time, I will send for you. And he postponed his salvation. I don't know if he had uh, that convenient time any time later, but, but here we see that he just brushed aside the opportunity that he got. There was an opportunity to repent of his sins and accept Christ. Paul presented the gospel, but he just rejected. There were people... There are people in this world who postpone acceptance of Christ. You know, when gospel comes to them, yeah, we'll see later. Or maybe I'll pray later. Maybe I will receive him later. You know, if I accept Christ, I have to give up this habit. Maybe I have to give up something that is so pleasurable to me. There were times people just reject Christ because they don't want to give up certain things. But God will not send these opportunities all the time. You know, it says, when there is an opportune time, you accept Christ. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 talks about God knocking the door of our hearts. It says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. See, God is knocking the door of our hearts. If you have never opened the door of your heart, God is knocking today. Open the heart of, open your heart and receive Jesus into your heart. You know, if you postpone, you don't know what will happen the next moment. If we look for a convenient time, maybe that time will never come. Sometimes even for believers, we look for convenience to do God's ministry. We look for convenient time to involve in the ministry. You know, God is calling you to just right away involve. You know, Felix actually expected a bribe from Paul. Finally, he left Paul in the prison, even after two years, you know, just to please the Jews. Because he was facing uh, another corruption charge that Jews were accusing him of mishandling mobs and uh, doing a lot of corruption in, in Caesarea. So in order to please them, he left Paul in the prison. 
basically he lost an opportunity to get eternal life at the same time he lost an opportunity to free up paul now in closing what do we learn from this these uh, two chapters paul was standing before the crowds paul was not afraid of testifying before governors before kings before caesar how are we you know are we afraid of sharing our faith defending our faith are we afraid to give a reason do we know what we believe first of all if we know are we able to defend our faith before people who ask us you know god comforts us in the time of need when we are discouraged down and depressed god always comes to us you know sometimes we may not feel it but we have to know that god is there with us you know uh, in, in if you read book of revelation chapter 1 uh when uh, john john the disciple he had the vision he fell as though he was dead and then what happens jesus puts his hand on him on his shoulder and says behold i am with you do not be afraid so god always comes he always um, comforts us he always um, uh, takes away the discouragement and, and encourages us so we have to remember that god is with us when we go through these tough times in our lives and uh, also um, like felix and drisulla you know, they lost an opportunity to gain the eternal life if you postpone your decision to follow christ maybe you won't get that that opportunity again bible says today is the day of salvation and if you have never accepted christ today is the day of salvation we don't know what happens tomorrow next moment so we have to repent and invite christ into our lives and at the same time if god is calling you to be a witness before very hard hearted people before people who have been worshiping the idols before people who are so religious in other religions if god is calling you to go and share the good news we have to be obedient we cannot make we cannot uh, make an assumption that they will never believe christ here pa- paul was standing before these people who were cruel unjust immoral but still he was sharing his faith we are called to do that let's think about these things and whatever god wants you to do in your life let's obey let's pray and close